All right. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, appreciate you being here today. I'm Senate Minority Leader Mark Johnson. We just uh, saw some of the details roll out over the last uh, three days of the governor's uh, budget. Although, uh, you know, it, it's a large budget that he's rolling out, so it took a little extra time for him to do it. But as we're catching up on the details, there's a lot of glaring things that, that we're finding uh, that Minnesotans should be pretty uh, concerned about going forward. First of all, we've got a surplus of $17.6 billion currently. This budget spends all of that. Not only that, but it grows government by 25%. We're at a $52 billion budget currently. It's going to be up to a, around six, uh, $65 billion. Huge government growth in agencies. Huge government growth in taxation. This is a very, very concerning budget. Uh, that we've taken a little bit of time to start processing, but as you get further into the details, a lot of the promises that Democrats made and the governor himself made during the campaign are broken in this. Social Security tax, that's something that they promised uh, to repeal. The Social Security tax uh, exemption on there should have been part of the package. There's a small amount, a token amount, but it's not there. Things like that that we were really looking forward to and anticipating uh, are not part of the, the budget, only government growth. Uh, Lisa, do you want to jump in and we can Absolutely. continue? Well, good afternoon. Um, I am the minority leader in the House, Representative Lisa Damoth. Happy to be here with you today. In a time that there is a record surplus, $17.6 billion, Minnesotans are expecting to have that back. Unfortunately, what we heard today is Minnesotans are going to be spending and, and it's going to cost Minnesotans a little bit more to be here. And that was a little bit surprising. If we can't cut taxes now, when can we? Um, we know that there are areas that we need to focus on, as you've heard from Minority Leader Johnson, that promise of ending Social Security tax for Minnesotans. That was 100 percent is what we were expecting. That's what Minnesotans heard on the campaign trail. That's what we have talk been talking about as we came into session. But unfortunately, that's not what was proposed in the governor's budget today. We are expecting that for Minnesotans. We also know public safety is important. When we have record crime in Minnesota, we need to address that. The governor's proposal of $300 million that would go out to the cities and counties, uh, local governments, well, that is appreciated. Let me just put that in perspective for you. In a time of record crime in Minnesota, $300 million proposed for public safety, but yet the project over at the state office building to renovate that space, the minimum that we would be starting with is $500 million. Just to put that in perspective, we need to do better, we need to do more for Minnesotans. Education is another area. Our kids are falling behind. Instead of growing government, we have got to address literacy within our K-12 or early childhood 12 so our kids can, can uh, they can do what they need to do as they look into the workforce. We've got to protect our students, empower families. Child care is another issue that is of great concern. We have to look at early learning scholarships and way to empower Minnesota families to do what they need to do. There are many areas of waste, fraud, and abuse that have been talked about over time. Growing government in different areas is not a way to solve that. You think of paid family leave. Something that's important for families, more mandates aren't going to get us there, nor is adding another 410 employees to the state to oversee that. That's not the way to do this for Minnesota. Questions? Governor just talked about the biggest tax cut in state history. Is that something Republicans can get excited about? Did he, did he also mention uh, the Social Security that he's going to be leaving on the table to tax? Or, you know, we've got the paid family leave. That's also going to be an employer and employee tax that's going to come up. It's going to punish our employees and our employers across the state. I mean, we had a conformity bill that, that cut, what was it, $109 million off of that uh, taxes. But when you look at the greater uh, aspect of all the taxes that are coming in and, and the ones that they promised to repeal that aren't, I mean, that, that's such a, a splash in the bucket uh, that uh, it's something that we've got to move past and really give Minnesotans true relief. So thank you. Leader Davis, could you talk about the two? The headline is largest tax cut in state history. 
Um, we are increasing spending by over 25%, and that is one of the largest increases um, from going back, looking at each biennium from 1998. Um, we are looking at record increase in spending. So yes, we can talk about tax cuts, but I'm looking at the increased spending. Can you talk about the um, <clears throat> rebate checks? I know when the forecast came out, you kind of expressed an openness to maybe any way to get some money back to Minnesotans. Do you support a rebate check? You know, getting um, the rebate back in a certain portion to Minnesota tax filers is something that we are very open to. Um, I would much rather see it go that way than into increased governmental spending. I would like to see it back in the pockets of Minnesotans. But permanent tax cuts are what we need to be looking at. Again, going back to that Social Security promise again um, is something that we definitely need to look at. On Social Security, do you have, I mean, there are some Democrats who have vowed to pursue a full you know, repeal of, of the taxes. Is there a path for Republicans to build coalitions with those Democrats to get the, to get that full repeal passed, whether or without leadership support? Um, I, I believe that if it is standalone ending the tax on Social Security, we would look very seriously at that and be willing to work together on it. Senator, I don't know if you want to no, answer that. I would that. agree. I would agree. If, if it's something that's standalone that we can, if we can come to, together with, I think it's a great idea. What are your feelings on the tax credit approach where they have a lot of targeted tax credits for special uh, parts of the population and not looking at like a sales tax cut or an income tax rate cut? Yeah, I appreciate that question, too. And, and you know, our families need relief. I, this is something government is clearly healthy, and we're trying to grow it again by 25 percent here, the, gover the governor is. Uh, those tax credits uh, I, will go to families, help them out. But the reality is what we really need to be doing is, is making sure that taxpayers across this state have a lower burden and have an incentive to be here and pay those taxes. So. Uh, you know, that's one way of getting money back to folks, but I think broader relief uh, through tax cuts is a way that people are going to be seeing that relief week after week, month after month. Well, Leader Damon, on child care, mm -hmm. part of that tax credit, a large part of it is a child tax credit, child care tax credit to go to families to help them afford those rising costs. Do you feel that your caucus could support that in some way, knowing that it would be targeted to those child care costs. We are looking at each part as the proposal has come out. It's just been a couple of hours we're looking at that. But again, our caucus fully supports um, early learning scholarships or a way that we can empower families and parents over programs. So if that's what's included, we're willing to look deeper at it. What about the level of income limits first on those checks, the rebate checks? We're already hearing from people who say eh, it's not a very high limit, 75, 150, and then Social Security also having the limit. What about those limits? You know, we need to look at all of the limits. Again, going back to Social Security, 100 percent. I don't believe in limits on that. I think it should be ended completely. As far as the other income levels, we will look at those as we move forward. Do they strike you as, you know, middle class, leaving out middle class folks? You know, I think that we need to really reevaluate what middle class really is in some ways, too. But everything is more expensive. We need to make Minnesota a place that is affordable to live, uh, to work, to raise a family, and to stay in when you retire. Senator, any response yet on, on those income limits, please? You know, we haven't had an opportunity to digest that. So uh, once we get more into the numbers there, but if they are what you say they are, uh, we got to re really reevaluate who we're making sure that, that Minnesotans are struggling. It doesn't matter. Uh, what your numbers are at the lower end there, uh, we've got to make sure that we're, we're getting help to people in the best way possible. Madam Leader, the governor says largest tax cut in Minnesota history. I understand that you're focusing on the spending aspect of it, and I pose that question to him. I said, you probably are going to object to that. And what he said was, this is spending that Minnesotans want investments toward the future of Minnesota. How do you respond to that? You know, one of the areas when I think of, if we're looking at areas of spending, we know that our nursing homes and our um, areas that take care of um, people with disabilities and th that workforce is so short. If we're going to look at spending, we need to look at some of the areas in our state that is most hard hit with lack of workforce, families that aren't able to get their loved ones out of the hospital into care that they need. Those are areas of spending that we need, need to actually look at. I think those are addressed in his budget, at least in some way, shape, or form. So you agree with that part of it? Um, I haven't seen the proposal directly on that. We're willing to have conversations. We know that's an area that we have got to address, though. Part of the governor's budget accounts for paying off all of the state's outstanding debt on the stadium. Do you guys support that? 
Again, it's one of those proposals that we're going to have to review within that. I mean, the devil's in the details, and I have not seen uh, the exact language within that proposal. What's in this proposal from the governor that you like and you want to work with him on and you want to influence to make it better? Sure. There, um, <laughs> would you like to talk about all the things that we like on the proposal here? So. <laughs> You know, what we want to make sure is any part in that budget that is helping Minnesotans, not with mandates, not with regulations, not with increased taxes, we are happy to come along beside the governor and help him because our goal is making sure that Minnesotans' lives are better in every possible way. And so where his budget does that, we're willing to do that. But at this point, when you're increasing taxes, creating new government bureaucracy, growing government by 25 percent on the backs of Minnesotans, that's not something that we're willing to support. How can you do anything if you don't have control of the House or the Senate? I mean, where's your power? Go for it. Okay. Um, that's a great point. Um, as we came into this session, it was very important to me that we worked along with the majority within our committee process to find ways to not just leave things as they were, but to actually make bills better. We proved that with the first tax conformity bill. Um, our leads and our committee and the committee chairs are working together to find ways that we can help Minnesotans and work together. Is it difficult? Yes, but we are willing to do that. The debate that we have on the floor, you'll watch those go through where we can find areas of possible common interest. You're going to hear when we don't, but we are still committed to working together. When you look at the state geo Geographically, we have 70% in the Republican Party that we represent geographically. So I don't want to leave Minnesotans out, the fact that there is a trifecta. I don't want to leave Minnesotans out in any way, but I want to make sure all Minnesota voices are heard. So working together, being collaborative, finding areas of agreement, and then moving forward on those are some of the best ways. If I could add on that, too, I think one of the things that our uh, leads have been very good at is building those relationships across the aisle. I know the House has done a very good job, and with the change of leadership uh, around the Capitol here, too, we've really encouraged that. And being able to influence when you can uh, and working with uh, the other side, and, and I think that's been pretty fruitful in a number of areas, maybe not the high-level bills that you're seeing presently, but I think, uh, you know, on the bread and butter issues, I think there's a lot of uh, similar things that we, we can agree on on those two. So it's actually been uh, pretty productive on, on some bills that you haven't exactly seen coming out quite yet. Do you have a top number yet on bonding, since you guys are going to need your votes on bonding? We do not. And we are in discussion. We're looking at everything. You know, we didn't get one done last year. We don't have a number yet, but we're in discussion. Are you optimistic? Because we've heard the threat from the speaker that they can just go cash. Republicans are going to come along with borrowing. You know, I think that uh, Minnesota is served best when we work together. And although there could just be a, a bonding that would be done with pure cash, I just think that we are served better when we work together. Um, I know in conversation with the governor, he has expressed the interest that it would be bipartisan, that they would be able to do a bonding bill, a geo bonding bill in a bipartisan way. And so that's what we are hopeful for. Yeah, and the, the idea of a cash bill, uh, I think when you look at the governor's budget and you look at the bills coming through the legislature right now, I don't know how big of a cash bill they're talking, but it looks like they're really spending themselves into a very small bonding bill if that's, if that's going to be the approach that they take. So we hope to work together. I think we had uh, close to an agreement last year, and so we've got a good starting point and, and really hope to work together on, on developing something. But oversight with the growth of government here and the feeding our future scandal that all of you talked about on the campaign trail, what about oversight with this growth of government? I think expectation of Minnesotans is that um, their tax dollars would be used in the best way possible and not wasted. When we uh, handle waste, fraud, abuse within the systems, as we've seen in so many different areas, the tax dollars that remain are actually spent on the on the programs that are out there that we need to spend on. Um, and so attacking waste, fraud, and abuse without growing government to do it is the expectation. So, so Madam Leader, as, as you uh, look to the 24 election, and uh, maybe it's too early to say, but just on this budget alone, and when letters to the editors start appearing in the greater Minnesota newspapers and so forth, what, what are the themes going to be as you look to regain the, the majority in 24? 
You know, I think the themes that are existing for Minnesota right now have been the same all along. It needs to be an affordable place to live. We need to have safe communities. Our businesses need to be able to thrive. Our families need to be able to thrive. And Minnesota is a great place to be. That is going to be the message that has been um, all along and does not change. How we get there may look a little bit different, but Minnesota is a great place to be, and we need to make it a state that people want to choose to stay in. Was that abortion vote the other night in the House? I think, I don't know if it was you or some of the Republicans were saying there's five members on the DFL side that are going to rue the day that they voted for this bill. How much of an issue is that going to be as you campaign again for re-election? You know, I think as we came into this session, um, we had a 17, well, we have right now a $17.6 billion surplus. Minnesotans were looking for their money. To see the majority prioritize abortion, and not tax cuts or attacking the, sur the surplus was a message that was sent. What we did on the House floor is we offered amendments that were reasonable, they were common sense, they were unfortunately rejected. That does not offer a safer place for women. It was extreme abortion laws that were being pushed forward and it was not what Minnesota needed. We already had that right guaranteed. This pushed it to an extreme point. Again, we need to get back to the fact that we have a $17.6 billion surplus. Minnesotans are facing higher costs on every, every area. We have a workforce shortage. We have a public safety crisis. And I think there is a lot that we need to address in Minnesota. Can I, sure. Can I just ask, broadly speaking, is it difficult at all to form a opposition when there's just so much money at play? I mean, you've been talking about like, well, we haven't been able to dive into the specifics. I know every budget is large, right? But, you know, we've been seeing items that in past years might make up the entirety of a budget surplus that are a smaller bit of this or of that. And with the, the pace of things going on at the legislature, I mean, can you just talk about like forming sort of an, an opposition when things are this vast and moving this quickly? Sure. And I think that's a great question I think Minnesotans need an answer to because when you're looking at the pace of what's going on down at the state capitol right now with committees and bills being heard that are major bills, major committee uh, um, committees that are going on around here, what you're finding is that even the press isn't able to cover the amount of material that's coming out. So it's hard for people and staff and constituents to really get an understanding of what, what's happening and it's hard to build up uh, build up alliances, build up coalitions that might be able to help on either side uh, with what's going on uh, down here in St. Paul. So it's something that Minnesotans across the state should be concerned about at the pace and the effect that these ex extreme bills are taking uh, in on our state. One more. Um, are, could both of you weigh in on education? So there's a big surplus and the governor is proposing you know, tackling some cross subsidies and increasing the formula. And is that, you know, with the surplus, is that, do you, can you be on board with education spending? I'll, look, sure, I'll jump in first. Go. On education spending, I think what we're looking for is fair funding. And when we look across the state, all of our districts are not funded in a fair manner. It, it puts um, some of our smaller districts at a disproportionate rate of funding compared to some of our larger districts. What we're looking for is fair funding across the board. Um, education is an area that we need to ensure that our kids are ready to go. Literacy is a very important thing. The cross-subsidy on special ed specifically, the feds have said that they are, um, you know, they're, they're on the hook for 40% to cover that cross-subsidy for our districts, yet they don't do it. So instead of the state stepping in when the feds should do it, I think we need to put the pressure on the feds to pay their part, and then the state needs to come in and do our part too to be able to cover that for Minnesotans. Um, hearing from all of our districts um, and way, where they are at, again, we have teacher shortages. We need to make sure that people want to go into the profession of teaching, that our kids are, um, are, are excelling and succeeding in their education. And we need to look at uh, school choice for families. Sometimes what is being proposed as the best thing for students might need to change depending on what families need to do. So school choice is a, a topic that we need to have a conversation on. 
Yeah, and, and so that's after two years of COVID shutdowns, I mean, our students are, are lagging behind still. I mean, there's effects that are going to be generational, and we got to make sure that the investments that we're making are tied to making sure that our students' test scores are, are coming up and that, that they're recovering from those years. We've got one of the world's best education systems here. How are we investing in that education system in a way to make sure that our students are again on top of the pile? So that's something that where we can find uh, return on that investment, we're all for it. We care about our kids. We want to see them succeed in that way. So uh, that's one of those things where fair investment in our schools is going to be a major priority. Thank you.